everyone. My name is Kelly Johnson, and I lead the International Payment Strategy and Product Team at National Bank of Canada. I'm extremely excited about our panel today. When the call for speakers came out for the summit, there was our theme was uh, an easy choice. Data rich, faster payments. They're coming. In some jurisdictions, they're already here. So why not? leverage the experience and insights of global, global subject matter experts who've already seen this transformation first ha firsthand happening around the world. We invite you to ask questions using the chat function and we'll be answering as we go. Uh, so without further ado, um, joining me today is Cyrus Bathwala, Global Head of Real-Time Payments at JP Morgan. Barbara Weiss, Director Core Payment Product Structured Sales at Bank of America, and Richard Ross, Senior Manager, Emerging Payment Products at Cuskill Limited. I'll ask each of you to tell us a little bit more about yourself and the roles as we as, and your roles as we dive right in. We know the world is undergoing massive payments transformation, uh, specifically focusing on speed and data, but many countries seem to have a different approach, whether it be focus on corporate versus P2P, uh, different sequencing of activities to lay a foundation for what they believe is going to be the future of payments. Cyrus, you're lucky number one. Drawing on your experience in other jurisdictions, and especially given the focus of your current role, can you comment on the benefits and the headwinds with Canada's own strategy? Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here, Kelly. Thank you for having me. Um, and, and as Kelly said, uh, so my name's Cyrus. I run uh, real-time payments for JP Morgan, both here in, in the US and North America, but also abroad in some 40 plus countries. Um, and prior to that, I actually spent quite a bit of time in, in Canada, a number of years with some of the folks on this panel, actually, uh, working as a consultant, which I've done in a number of other jurisdictions, building out these RTP um, core platforms. Um, it's a very, very, uh, you know, pointed question you asked there, Kelly. I think a couple of observations. Number one is uh, R RTP genuinely can be a, a fairly substantial game changer when it comes to capability we can offer our clients. But uh, there is a tendency if we are not uh, thinking at the forefront of uh, challenging the status quo, there is a tendency to put an old train car on a set of new train tracks. And what I mean by that is we, instead of focusing on the value proposition drivers, we instead focus on launching an RTP platform, which creates faster, faster payments, but maybe drops on the floor some of the uh, more um, nuanced capabilities, which aren't really captured in the name real-time payments. And so what does that mean? Things like single global experiences for our clients, certainly from a JP Morgan perspective, given we have um, you know, over 40 countries live, we're heavily, heavily focused on not just being in market, but also being in market with a consistent customer experience. And that re recognizes that real-time payment systems aren't all created equally and they are, there are nuances and difference between them and we need to absorb that. Um, relative to Canada's strategy, um, consolidation of clearing systems is certainly something we're seeing across the board in other markets, think in LATAM, uh, even in um, EMEA in the UK with the new payments architecture, as an example. Canada needs to consider what that evolution looks like. I, I understand the current objectives look at modernizing things like the links, RTR and retail batch payments, as well as enhancing existing platforms, but facilitating interoperability across the payments ecosystem, which I believe is the third of, of three pillars for the program, uh, needs to be considered. We struggle with a similar thing here in the US. Um, as an example, we have a combination of TCH, EWS and soon to be Fed now. And so it's not a unique challenge necessarily, but it is one that needs to be um, considered and can be theoretically a headwind based on your, your original question. What do you do to deal with that? It's a big focus on ubiquity and interoperability between the platforms and most definitely uh, so that you don't inhibit adoption and growth. But I think it's also important to recognize the benefits you mentioned, Kelly. Um, Interact as an existing player in the Canadian market, while uh, complicated to fit into the set of requirements and ecosystem Canada ultimately wants to achieve in the long run. We cannot ignore the fact that they currently have a huge user base. They've been live for 20 something years with various different capabilities. So I think it would be uh, naive to assume that they don't need to be part of that overall ecosystem and picture. So it's all going to be about how you package it together so you don't inhibit things like adoption and ubiquity, which can ultimately kill, frankly, the end value proposition. 
Thanks, Cyrus. Um, interoperability and harmonization stuck out a lot there. Themes I think we're going to hear a lot through our conversation today. So over to you, Richard. Um, so you've also had a number of really interesting roles that have allowed you to see payments modernization from multiple views. Drawing on your experiences, where what are your thoughts on the benefits and possible challenges ahead for Canada? What, in your opinion, must we get right? Sure. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, and, you know, thank you to uh, everyone for, for having me here today to speak to you. Uh, so my name is Richard Ross. I'm a senior manager at Costco Limited, uh, which is a, a payments provider here in Australia. Uh, I currently lead the Emerging Payment Services team. Uh, and in, in a nutshell, what I do is help bring a number of payment innovations to life on our new real time rail. Uh, and I've also had the pleasure of working for, for Payments Canada and working with a number of people within the financial industry on, on payments modernization over the last few years. Um, so I, I think, Kelly, with regards to the benefits and, and you know, the, the possible challenges for Canada, I think it really stems to thinking about payments modernization and as part of that, the global move to ISO 2022 as, as a real catalyst for end-to-end -end change. Uh, seeing this as an opportunity to reimagine the relationship the financial institutions have with their clients, other providers, and with the other fintechs within the industry, and really leveraging that to then drive the necessary innovation to not just focus on improving the current state, existing pain points, but really taking this opportunity to reinvent it. Um, and I think when you take that approach, you, you'll see a number of benefits come to life I think one of the critical ones is really around clear direction and process towards, sorry, progress towards an ideal end state from both a customer perspective as well as a back office uh, point of view. Um, and this really means moving away from the traditional thinking of, you know, how will mod improve what I currently do today to really thinking about what are the experiences that I want to deliver? How do I want to reinvent the experiences that my customers go through and ultimately what's the value that you can add or derive from the client interactions that you have uh, with your existing product set and your existing services um, and i think leveraging that kind of mindset you start to see things that we've definitely seen here in australia and, and in other jurisdictions around the delivery of first point resolution tools uh, we're seeing lifestyle applications we're seeing conversational AI being used far more to service clients. Uh, and we're, we're seeing a range of proactive services that really deliver transactional information in a way beyond just the traditional static statement, but really start to be part of the interaction with the customer. Um, I, I think the second piece that I'd really focus on and is definitely near and dear to me is, you know, the need to improve inclusion and access to the ecosystem. So in my current role, we're involved quite heavily with bringing uh, payment service providers and other fintechs onto the existing payment rails that the financial industry uh, has helped build to really um, create opportunities to offer innovative services. But I think to do that, organizations really need to take a, a look at what they do and think, am I the right organization to offer this service or this particular experience on my own? Are there, are there other providers out there that I should seek to work with or partner with that will help me bring some of these things to life? And I think with that pragmatism, you'll start to see real best of breed services, real unique offerings, and the truly innovative services that many customers are asking for that payments modernization can actually deliver and, and bring to market. Um, services that, you know, traditional FIs don't really work in or it's not really part of their existing remit. Um, you know, a case in point in my current role is, you know, we've been working with a number of brokerages and trading houses to deliver real time payments to support the transactions that they perform from everything from commodities to crypto, where speed is key uh, and liquidity and payment certainty is absolutely critical. Um, and, the, and the last true benefit that I see really is around scalability on interoperability and you know, future capabilities. So when I think back to the new payments platform work that was done here in Australia for phase one, it was very much focused on push payment. Uh, now we've moved on to the next overlay service on the rail, which is the mandate uh, services uh, solution, which is being called Pay2 here in Australia, where we're gonna see a real shift towards 
true real time for not just the traditional push payment, but where we start to move away from batch debit payments uh, to now start to deliver true proactive customer managed uh, payments that they can set up themselves, control and manage. Uh, the interesting thing is a lot of this foundation was built as part of MPP phase one, but now we're really starting to see that early work come to fruition with the work that's being done on pay two, which will really start to see traditional, very friction heavy payments sort of moving to the wayside and, and true real time and true transparent and immediate payments coming to the fore for clients. Um, you know, to get to, to this state though, I think one of the, the there's a number of challenges um, that I know we face in Australia and certainly in the time in Canada, I, I saw um, some that were there as early as, you know, 2017, at least when I first joined the payments modernization journey, but are, are probably still there today. And one of those touches on experience, you know, finding the right people to to help bring this uh, the the payments modernization journey to life. And I think, you know, with the ongoing pandemic, this has certainly exacerbated the problem for many jurisdictions, and we're still definitely feeling that here in Australia. Um, the other part is understanding that the modernization journey is not just a technical or functional piece of work. There is a real cultural modernization piece to this. And what I mean by that is a need to truly understand the transparency, immediacy and criticality of real time and how it's going to change the relationship that FIs have with their clients, particularly those who are more familiar with the traditional five day processing or the business day processing rules to what does 24 by 7 really mean. Um, and I think the last one, again, because it's just so near and dear to me, is really around access. Um, there's going to be a real critical need to look at how you balance the needs of the market and industry to offer up the right level of access, to open up the right levels of participation and drive the innovation necessarily, necessary, whilst maintaining the standards really needed to secure the level of trust uh, in the system. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, I agree. You know, with all the time, efforts, costs that's being spent right now, we really do owe it to ourselves to build something transformational for the future. Um, accessibility and governance really are playing a critical role, and we'll get back to that a bit. But on the client front, that's a good segue into Barbara. Barbara, what do you, um, can you tell us a little bit more about your role and the discussions um, with your clients, how they're changing um, as global payments transform? Have you seen a shift in how businesses are looking to align themselves uh, with payments transformation and the changing industry? And if so, um, how what considerations are they making in their own strategies? Well, thank you, Kelly. I'm very happy to be here today. Yes, I'm Barbara Weiss. I'm a director in our product structured sales organization, and it's my role to help our clients craft best in class payment solutions. So many of my clients want to learn as much as they can about the latest payment methods in order to lower their costs and increase their efficiency. And when I sat in corporate treasury 20 years ago, you know, payment choices were, were limited. If one needed to make a same-day cross-border payment, one executed a wire transfer. Today, the payments industry and changes to technology are moving so rapidly, and there are so many new competing players and rails popping up that it's difficult for a company to keep up. They don't have the bandwidth to become payments experts, and, and they're asking for automated tools to help them decide the best payment method to use in a particular situation. They face challenges keeping up with the differences in the various deadlines, the amount limits, the costs, the rules changes, and they look to their bankers to help them make sense of global payment trends. In terms of setting strategy, Kelly, you know, clients are, are quite guarded about making changes too quickly. They just don't know how these newer, faster payment methods can fit into their, into their current business model. They worry that 24-7, 365 is going to unduly burden their treasury operations. Companies are actually trying to figure out how instant payments will affect defining when to set their cash position and making funding decisions. And while payments are becoming more real-time, ancillary processes like information reporting and the hours when companies can make investments or draw against credit facilities they're not 24-7, so they remain cautious. I tell them that payments modernization really is an evolution rather than a revolution, and they still have an opportunity to define what they want their end of day to be. What is within their control right now from a strategy perspective is modernizing the technology that they employ to be ready 
to leverage payments innovation and modernization. Clients are upgrading to the latest cloud-based ERPs. They're buying more sophisticated treasury management system applications. And they're beginning to embrace ISO 2022 XML so that they can leverage newer global payment methods. Corporate payment strategy is also being shaped by open banking and real-time APIs. And if you want to use an instant payment method, then consuming your bank's payments API for real-time execution is critical. Another change in the strategy is the movement away from paper. You know, checks have remained popular for a supplier payments because electronic remittance solutions have been limited. What the pandemic has shown us is that companies must embrace digital payment methods and quickly eliminate paper disbursements because they're impossible to produce when people are working remotely. And since the latest ERPs can provide remittance details via email, there's no need to write a check. And in concert with this trend, there has been exponential growth in AI and ML driven cash application products that can seamlessly lift remittance details from email or other sources. Another trend that I'm seeing is, is tokenized payments. They've become critically important because when we think about business email compromise, hacking, you know, uh, in the US with the pipeline, it's, it's ransomware, you know, every companies are really reluctant to collect and store supplier banking details. Even the U.S. RTP rail, which currently requires banking information, is becoming tokenized through the Zelle network. So alias-based supplier payment networks, those card programs, really enable companies to enjoy the benefits of not having to store sensitive banking information and still leverage electronic payments with rich remittance. And then lastly, I will say that one of the biggest trends that I'm seeing is consumerization in terms of strategy. You know, it's bleeding into the corporate world. Corporate treasurers and AT managers, they want to make payments to their consumer customers or, or any customer with the same convenience that they enjoy in their personal life. So options to pay into digital wallets or to utilize popular payment networks like Zelle and PayPal have really made paying consumers easier, especially if you're an employer in the gig economy when you need to pay real time. Thanks, Barbara. Those are great insights. And it just goes to show you back to what Richard was saying. It's so important to bring clients along with us in this journey. I remember uh, attending a conference uh, a couple of years ago where a senior treasurer of a really large firm um, stood up and basically said they didn't want real time. Their cash position was done at four o'clock. Their investments decisions had been made and they didn't want cash sitting idly in their accounts overnight. Um, so, you know, there, there's different perspectives and it's so important for to keep clients um, in mind um, as we look to match the needs against some of the, uh, the new and uh, interesting things that are coming out in our market, right? Um, so um, we've been hearing a lot for a while now that data uh, is the new currency of the future, uh, the new oil. Uh, but it's critical that banks uh, and businesses alike figure out how to extract value from it. When we look at ISO 2022, uh, the richness of data it can carry, how do organizations actually move past the mindset of technology impact, as Richard had mentioned earlier, uh, and start thinking strategically about how to use it? So Richard, I'm going to start with you on this one. Um, in your opinion, what does success look like here? Uh, what do you have some examples or use cases where you believe ISO 2022 is going to live up to the hype, or are we going to continue to face challenges here around adoption? Sure. Thanks, Kelly. That's, it's, it's a great question, particularly uh, as, as an, uh, you asked the one probably ISO nerd on the call. <laughs> um, I, I think for me, success for ISO 2022 is really going to come to those who see ISO 2022 as more than just data. Um, you know, it's going to live up to the hype if you understand that the value of the data isn't just from getting more of it, but really understanding how you then want to harness that information to drive, you know, strategic benefit and strategic innovation. Um, now, so say something somewhat controversial here that, you know, many of the benefits that ISO 2022 delivers, structure, richer data, context, and in the case of modernized rails, immediacy, this is really ancillary to the objective that I think people really need to start thinking about ISO 2022. Because I think the benefits that ISO 2022 are really the enablers of the innovation that you need, as opposed to necessarily just the answer to the problem. 
Um, Because I think when you just look at the benefits that ISO 2022 bring, it's really framed again in that context of what are my existing pain points. Whereas I think if you really truly think about what it can enable, it takes you out of the current state and really starts to bring in the art of the possible. Um, so in, in terms of some of the, the use cases where I think it can really start to bring ISO 2022 to life, you know, we always hear about the customer payables and receivables journey. And you know, it, it's a tried and tested one, it works, but I think there's more beyond that that we really start to think about here. And part of that is challenging how you currently leverage your channels to support your clients. You know, rather than just giving them more statement information, can you start to drive and improve AI to proactively service your customers through their channel interactions? Um, you know, I've seen instances where ISO 2022 data is actually vetted and parsed to start driving acquisition and retention campaigns for a range of different products and services. And they're seeing a significantly larger set of response rates to those campaigns because they're far more targeted than they were in the past. Um, and I'm also seeing data being used to actually vet existing processes such as fast tracking lending approvals because now they can actually quickly scan a customer's transaction history to see what the true expenditure and income uh, position is of a client rather than just working on sort of uh, notional figures provided by clients. Um, I, I think the other aspect that I also see that ISO 2022 can really start to deliver benefits for is, you know, we always look at reconciliation and processes for customers. You know, they are absolutely critical, but there are also internal back-end processes for many financial organizations where ISO 2022 can deliver some significant uplift of, of, of current technology. You know, there's there's always the, the easy example of financial crime, fraud monitoring, sanctions all of those tools can really be enhanced by the introduction of new information that's available. But it also then asks, begs the question, are my current tools fit for purpose? Can I truly harness this information? So I think there's two sides to that coin around ISO 2022, both from a technology as well as you know the new data that's delivering. And I, I think the, the other thing really is around the commercial data as a service propositions. So ISO 2022 is going to create opportunities for, for data holders to think about tiered data as a service plays in the market. You know, notwithstanding the, the, the privacy and data rules for, for the many legal people who, who will be involved in those discussions, there will be opportunities to think about how to monetize the insights that this data provides. Uh, so, you know, just wanting to leverage that data as a new oil analogy, a key part of that really is opportunities to think about, are you going to offer raw data? Could you then partially refine the data? Or are there opportunities to, to, to monetize and sell fully refined data to your customers? And I think a key part of that is really understanding the customers, the complexity, and the ability for them to do their own analytics on the information you provide for them. Um, and the last really critical opportunity I see, um, you know, knowing that consumer directed finance is a big thing, uh, or at least one of the next ki new kids on the block that's going to hit Canada, um, open banking here is driving a significant amount of uh, discussion at the moment. You know, we're seeing discussion within our consumer data rights team um, about how richer data, and not necessarily just ISO 2022 data, but how an open data sharing ecosystem can share information underpinned by real-time modernized payment rail to help non-traditional FIs get involved in the, the payment flow, in, in, in the payment ecosystem to drive new services, offer new uh, range of capabilities that previously weren't possible. Um, and much of this discussion is really focused around the creation of what they call the killer lifestyle app. You know, the lifestyle app that isn't just my banking app. It's actually my app that I use for a range of different things. And it's 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 my go-to. It's it dare I say it's as a it's as a habit forming as someone going to Instagram or Twitter every morning on their way in, this becomes their app of choice. Um, but I think there are some challenges and there are some barriers to get there. You know, we're facing the same ones here in Australia. Uh, I think uh, Cyrus mentioned one earlier with regards to the train car analogy that he used. You know, we're seeing legacy technology reuse and what I would call Frankensteining of technology to 
help support modernization actually create the poor foundation for what needs to be there to truly support and truly you know harness the benefits that this new data brings um, there's a significant challenge around data taxonomy and standards that needs to be addressed around you know even though there are standards being implemented there's a range of different challenges with how those things are then applied and used for different products and services that needs to be uh, cleared up you know, and one of those is just as simple as what data can I use? For what purpose can I sell it? What's the liability involved? Uh, and the last one, security. You know, it's it's how do I allow the lowest common denominator player in my ecosystem to hold this information yet still remain compliant whilst not being so cost prohibitive that I can't open up the market? So I think there, there's some of the barriers, but you know, there, there are things that can be overcome uh, and you know can lead to some exciting innovations in the future. Thanks. Yeah. And it's interesting to see because it's it's really not, again, the technology, right, that's holding us back. It's the governance. It's the consent, the trust, the framework. It's all the peripheral that that we need to get us there. And I love that term, art of the possible. I use it a lot because that's what we really need to be thinking. Um, and it's, you know, when we look at the topics like this and we realize how big the big picture really is. And Cyrus, this is a great segue to you, especially given your role and what you're seeing. So you probably have, um, uh, you know, some real life examples as well on how ISO is proving transformational. Is there anything particular that stands out for you? Yeah, look, I, 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 it's a fair question. And, and Richard has provided an outstanding summary, un, unsurprisingly, with the with the similar accents and the fact that we used to work together for, you know, close to a decade. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the phrases I, I use is pe people like to think that ISO 2022 and message standardization is going to solve world hunger. And I, I think we have to be a little bit cautious about just how transformative a message standard on its own is. It's not so much the fact that we have a message standard, but more so the fact that there is consistency in adoption of that message standard, right? Uh, it's, it's almost akin to, and this is probably how Richard educated me 10 years ago about how message standards work. It, it's akin to the mail system, how your um, envelope is shaped, sized, uh, where you put the data on that envelope allows it to be automatically read or automatically read uh, by legacy post snail mail um, optical readers, right? Uh, so I think what's important is not so much the actual standard and, and what it has enabled, but more so with the consistency with which it has been adopted. And that most definitely has been a challenging experience for the better part of 25 years, because ISO 2022 is not a brand new standard. It's actually a, was originally generated as a batch payment standard. So I think, yes, recognizing that there's power within the standard, there's power within data, that's all completely accurate. But the opportunity is probably how you harness it uh, together as an ecosystem. Uh, so if I were to use that as the measure of success, what have we seen that's been you know, particularly standout, both, both positive and negative? Um, certainly internally within a financial organization and institution. This is probably where it starts. Uh, the robustness of the data reduces payments friction from a customer experience standpoint, but it also improves things like um, our internal reconciliations during an incident or during a, a situation where a client has had an issue with transferring their, their, their files or their API-based single payments to us and we need to reconcile. Uh, it's helped us with both AML and sanction screening. So what, how and why? Were we not screening effectively previously? No, we absolutely were. But as soon as you carry more data within a, within a message and therefore a transaction, you're able to improve the fuzzy logic that you put in between a uh, you know binary scan and a, a physical investigation, which significantly enhances automation. It improves the end-to-end -end customer timeline and therefore experience. So it's all about having a little bit more data at your disposal internally within the organization, within the bank. Um, and certainly that extends to folks like our um, agency provision, PSPs, that kind of thing. Um, and so that's probably my second topic is we've been able to enable a number of new use cases, both here at JP Morgan and, and I've seen elsewhere in particular Europe with the addition of fields like the ultimate debtor and ultimate creditor fields that has enabled new market entrants, the, the likes of your typical, um, uh, you know, PayPal, Square, Stripes uh, and, and relevant global peers 
uh, to actually play within our own ecosystem. And, and we as JP Morgan certainly view that as more of a partnership opportunity than anything else. Um, and I think the ability to carry data relative to multiple parties within a payment chain has proved to be quite helpful in enabling those use cases. Um, more mature markets have certainly seen things like supply chain automation, not necessarily only in real time, but think of SEPA core, uh, where there is regulatory push for corporates to adopt. And that is part of the challenge is that adoption ubiquity. Um, and, and we have seen benefits for things like motor vehicle manufacturers being able to automate the supply chain, just in time supply chain between both their uh, third parties, as well as the subsidiaries they own, but operate as separate organizations. I thought that was a very cool use case, but one that's going to take some time for us to get to here in, in North America, certainly, because the reality is we've had challenges with adoption. Uh, there's challenges with ubiquity, not just at banks, but at corporate organizations, because ERP systems are, tend to not be in the US sold as ISO 20022 enabled. Uh, they tend to be in our legacy corporate customers. They tend to not be even API uh, savvy. Uh, certainly our more tech forward West Coast clients, uh, we would say have a better adoption rate just because they're more familiar with API technology. They've got the right skill sets, competencies within their uh, tech shops. Um, and then finally, I think the obvious statement is probably around cross-border um, cross border real-time payments and the potential interoperability there. I think as we look at things like Fed now being developed and we're spending a lot of time looking at those message specs and the interoperability or potential interoperability we might see here in the US, that's not just focused on the different um, clearing systems here in the US, but globally. And I think the Fed's taking a fairly consistent stance, which is we are more interested in focusing on that long time long term, sorry, uh, growth objective on it for a cross border RTP. And I know we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but that's really where where my head's at in terms of what we've seen so far. There's also a, a story I tend to use, uh, which I haven't had the opportunity to talk about for some time. So I'm going to roll it out again, which is uh, used car sales, right? And it's not necessarily uh, the example that's going to generate the most amount of money. But it is it is very much one that I think makes it easy to relate to the power of, of this ISO 20022 message standard. And that is today when you when you sell a used car, let's say a personal used car or an auto trader website like that, the payments experience tends to actually be friction. Uh, it, it's it's either a cashier's check, cash, a slow uh, wire transfer potentially, uh, or a multi-day ACH. You know, there's probably alternate fintech based solutions which. Uh, may or may not be equivalent to a bank transfer, but for the most part, it's not a particularly frictionless experience. It's actually friction filled. Um, but if you were to remove that friction, let's say you had a 24 by seven um, uh, real time faster payments environment that you could make that $25,000, $35,000 transfer, you then all of a sudden remove the friction and expose yourself as a financial organization, whether you're a fintech that's that's PSPing off the back of a bank or otherwise. Um, you get the opportunity to be, get exposed to a broader business transaction. So what do I mean by that? Well, when you buy a car, what else do you do? You generally get insurance, you generally do DMV registration checks, you do stolen vehicle checks, you might use financing, you might purchase extended warranties and insurances. Um, all of those tend to be separate transactions, separate business interactions, uh, but they're all actually part of a, a single end-to-end uh, -end customer experience. So you could feasibly say, see, and we've seen our clients here at JP Morgan, as well as a couple in, in Australia that we've worked with on NPP, uh, look at this specific use case and slowly start building out this end-to-end -end experience. And how, why, how and why am I rambling about this when we talk about data and ISO 2022? Well, you can't do any of that without a centralized clearing environment that can exchange data such as VIN vehicle numbers, registration information, personal consumer information, who my bank is for potential financing. Um, those kinds of things could theoretically be done by a proprietary platform, but it's very convoluted and complex to build and it won't be ubiquitous. It will be for a subset of a consumer segment. If we can enable this for 80% of our US consumers to be able to receive such a payment message in their corporate, in their, sorry, their online banking portal, uh, that would likely change the game of used car sales. We think uh, it's, it's pretty exciting. It's something we're working on as an example that can be related to 
So maybe it's not necessarily something we've seen live in the market. We've seen part pieces and parts of that puzzle, but I think it's a good one to relate to when we talk about what the potential power is. I think it's an excellent, excellent use case. I lived it this summer in a pandemic, buying a car, having to go to a branch to get a bank draft. Um, so very, very re relevant. Uh, I appreciate that one for sure. Um, and on the topic of reducing friction, um, you know, this is a huge issue for corporates. Uh, Barbara, uh, you must be excited to see progress here. Um, having spent so many years in corporate treasury, we've hypothesized for years about the massive benefits data is going to provide to corporates, albeit back a lot of back office functions, as Richard mentioned, um, such as cash uh, reconciliation, faster, faster cash um, application and predicting customer behaviors. How are your clients uh, or how are you seeing clients approach ISO 2022? Thank you, Kelly. Um, well, I will say that most of our integrations and adoptions are ISO 2022. So that's really the good news. I, I really continue to be encouraged uh, by the continued retirement of bank proprietary formats, uh, things like SAP IDOC, and standards such as ASC X12 EDI. Um, one key barrier to using ISO 2022 XML is, is either a lack of client education about the benefits or having IT resources that are unfamiliar with it. Often I'll ask the client's IT associate you know, if familiarity with ISO 2022 XML, and the response will be, well, I can produce XML, and then I ask, but can you produce ISO 2022 XML? And then there's silence. And then the answer is, no, I'm not familiar with it. So many of my clients continue to use older formats implemented in the 90s, which works fine for traditional payment methods. Companies may not see the benefit of spending time and money upgrading their ERP systems and hiring you know, knowledgeable IT staff if things are working just fine. They state they need a business case. So, so I tell them they need to future-proof. And I advise that they would be unable to utilize the latest payment methods using these older formats. Banks are not investing in supporting the newer real-time rails and other overlay services using older formats. And during spirited client debates, I'll ask the client to ponder three things. A-track tapes, Betamax, and VHS. They get the message. And another reason that clients don't totally embrace ISO 20 or 22 XML is because of the existence of disparate clearing systems that don't support structured remittance end-to-end. -end. Even though SWIFT clearing and bank systems continue to migrate, other clearings are not moving quickly enough. When we think about the U.S., the, the NACHA format is still the most popular for ACH and employs X12 for remittance. And while the SEPA and U.S. RTP clearings utilize ISO 20 and 22 XML on, on the back end, these payment messages support only 140 characters, so suppliers are not receiving that enriched structured remittance. So why should a client invest in ISO 20 and 22 XML? If they can't carry rich remittance data end to end, it becomes just as easy to send an ERP-generated remittance email to the supplier. Look at U.S. real-time payments. Banks, are, I'm told, are reticent to develop the standalone remittance message that carries 4,000 characters. So now the clearinghouse is looking to establish a cloud-based document service to store PDFs for retrieval by the receiver of a request for payment. So, so this development and the prevalence of ERP emails can really undermine the adoption of ISO 20 and 22 XML as a global standard. And even if they want to use ISO 20 or 22, middle and lower end applications may not support it. I know of one ERP you know, vendor in particular that still clings to X12 as its native format, and some ERPs require the client to pay a hefty licensing fee to obtain an ISO 20 or 22 template, which still necessitates hiring a consultant to tweak it to become compatible with different banks. And in addition, Larger banks really have older systems that are not native ISO 20 or 22. So there are often multiple data translations that drive processing. Data truncation or elimination can result, especially if the map is poor or not kept current for newer payment methods. And, but the good news that I'm seeing is that bank systems are really being upgraded to, to, those, nat to those that natively process ISO 20 or 22. 
uh, standing up these systems in concert with the adoption by SWIFT and market infrastructures could enable data to move from end to end without translation. And lastly, another barrier that I'm seeing for the use of ISO 20 or 22 XML messages is really the continued growth of APIs. Why should corporates develop support for pain and camp messages if there's an urgency in the market for everything real time? As banks, ERP, and TMS vendors scurry to build out API capability. I really see the use of APIs as the vessels that will carry enriched data to banks. And many clients really don't have the bandwidth to develop their own APIs, so they're waiting for their vendors and their, you know, their vendors to consume bank APIs. So I feel those are some of the barriers to Kelly. That's really great, Barbara. Disparate systems and technology are definitely considerations um, uh, affecting corporates. I realize that we are running out of time, so I'm going to throw out one last question and ask that you keep your answers to about a minute. Um, crunch time. So, um, you know, a question for all of you, uh, and um, Cyrus, I'm going to start with you. Uh, most global payment projects seem to prim be primarily focused on domestic uh, systems and processes. And while there's an increased focus on enhancing cross-border payments, for instance, the, or for example, the Financial Stability Board Strategy and Roadmap um, released last year, what do you think are the biggest challenges uh, really are for interoperable cross-border payments? And where do we need to go next in order to break down these jurisdictional silos? Yep. Shamelessly stealing from Barbara's and yours conversation just a second ago, I don't think it's the technology that's going to be problematic. Uh, we've seen multiple technical pilots successful and actually just a, a recent establishment of um, two different market infrastructures between, uh, I believe it was, Thailand and Singapore be directly connected to each other. Um, I think the challenge will continue to lie, and this is not unique to RTP cross-border. Uh, it is between the standardization of things like operating rules, uh, ri risk and compliance guidelines, uh, exception handling processes, um, SLAs, sanction screening agreements between different markets. Uh, what am I? What is all that? It's the operating model. The whole thing is the operating model. So I think those items, plus obviously FX and liquidity, which I think can be managed and solved through. It's just really an agreement that needs to be made, and whether that's bilaterally or whether that's done at a central level via a, a utility organization, those are all up for grabs. All the options, but I think the biggest challenges will be getting everyone to agree to that operating model. It's not that it can't be done, it's that people need to understand how to compromise in their unique domestic regulatory environments. And if we wanna get it done, we're going to have to come to the table with our industry hats on, not our banker hats on. Great points. Richard, let's go to you next. So I, I'm also gonna unashamedly steal from, from Barbara and Cyrus, because I, I think I think the big challenge really is, you know, the operational process that Cyrus mentioned, and I think more broadly, just the overall rules and regs that will govern uh, cross-border payments. Um, you know, there's there needs to be agreement on data use, access rules, a li liability framework for the information that's passing as part of those payments. There's also, you know, domestic and regional variations in sanctions and AML processes and rigor that's applied by different jurisdictions, and that's going to add some significant challenge. Um, Cyrus, quote, uh, you know, highlighted the Singapore Thailand example. An interesting thing to note there is they're actually not requiring population of fields like remittance, full name and bank account details, which is, you know, part and parcel of most remittance payments today. So there needed to be some significant agreement between them to even agree to that process and to leverage a single alias addressing service to underpin their cross-border system. So I think those things are really part of part of the challenge. You know, and I don't, don't want to duplicate what Sarah said, but I think exactly what he said around we need to approach this with our industry hats on and not with our, with our banking hats. Absolutely concur with that. Thanks, Richard. And over to you, Barbara. One minute, last question. One minute. Okay, well, you know, there are 56 real-time rails globally, right? So, but it's difficult to connect the payments from one clearing system to another. So, so the challenge for truly interoperable cross-border payments is developing the most efficient ways to connect these networks, to move money seamlessly in real time. I know that you know there are a lot of problems with, with time zones and local currency controls and, and banking infrastructure like you know batch processing. And I know Swift is trying to work to connect these real-time rails using Swift Instant. Uh, but I will say in the time that I have left that a major competitor to Swift is, is Ripple. You know, Ripple is using RippleNet. It's, it's using distributed ledger technology to solve correspondent banking challenges 
And, you know, their technology offers bi-directional messaging in the payment system and, can, and actually uh, it can answer questions about the legitimacy of funds and the correctness of any information. So, you know, the, the banks that participate in RippleNet are able to exchange bilateral payment instructions in real time and enter payments into local real-time rail, leveraging bilateral arrangements. So I'm seeing that there's different, you know, competing schemes, right? It just illustrates how DLT is changing the payments landscape, which may obviate the need for slips instant transaction management capabilities. Thank you, Barbara. Well, I wish we could continue this discussion over drinks in person at the conference. Um, we're going to have to end it here. I want to thank you all so much for your time today. It was a really insightful discussion. It's been a huge pleasure being part of today's uh, panel, and we hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as we have. Thank you.